Today's podcast is presented by Podgo. Podgo is the easiest way for you to monetize your podcast. Providing podcasters with a flat rate for ad space, you always know how much you get when you include an ad from Podgo. I recently joined as a member, and you can too. Apply today to become a member and immediately be connected with the advertisers that fit your audience. That's podgo.co at p-o-d-g-o dot c-o. And please put unprofessional development in the how did you hear about Podgo? That will give us a little finder's fee. Thank you. Hello, unprofessionals. So as you know, now we're doing real commercials, not just the silly ones that we normally do. So today I've got with me my daughter, Micah. Say hello, Micah. Hi. She has an Etsy account. It's called what? Um, Room Makes Bracelets. Room Makes Bracelets, okay? We'll put a link in the show notes for you for sure. So she makes some friendship bracelets. She even has one that is kind of an unprofessional oh, bracelet where she's made the unpro um, letters in the bracelet. So if you need a bracelet, go to Rue's Bracelets. Anything else you want to say about your bracelets? No. Okay. But she's a little kid. She's 11 years old. She's entrepreneuring, you know, support her. And, um... Go to Ruse Bracelets. Click the link in the show notes. Thank you. Say goodbye, Micah. Bye. Thanks for tuning in, unprofessionals. Today's episode is brought to you by Starbucks gift cards. Starbucks gift cards. Taking up space in your wallet since 1997. We want to warn you about this episode. We're recording everything over the internet, so our audio isn't exactly perfect or, or controlled. If you hear us accidentally tapping the table or bumping the mic, that happens sometimes on online calls. We'll try to keep it to a minimum in the future, but the content is still fun, so enjoy. Unprofessionals, we need your help. Mealy and I keep trying to explain to the world how special we are, but they won't believe us. Here's what you can do. Check in the show notes for the link to the People's Podcast Awards. And please nominate us so the rest of the world can realize exactly how amazing we are. Enjoy! Well, hi there, unprofessionals. Welcome to an exciting episode of Unprofessional Development. I'm Tedesco. And I'm Mealy. And today we have with us Derek Coglin. I know him because I went to school with a guy named Steve Vigetti. And yes, Steve Vigetti heard so many spaghetti and meatball jokes his whole life and probably still does. And then I was talking to Steve and Steve said he knew this teacher who was funny and always tells funny stories at parties. And I said, well, then have him on the podcast. Like, let's connect. And so I connected to Derek. I said, hey, we've got an idiotic, stupid teacher podcast. Would you like to be on? He said, that sounded like a good plan. So, um... Derek, go ahead, introduce yourself, tell us how you got into teaching, and anything else that's relevant that someone would want to know about you. Well, first of all, I want to say thanks very much for having me on, and uh, I really enjoy anything that's idiotic and unprofessional. (laughs) Good. This is right up my alley. Um, That's awesome. So, I I got into teaching um, back in the late 90s. I'd actually trained to be a teacher in Ireland in the 80s. That's a really, really long time ago. Right? <laughs> That's the 1980s. Well, yes. yeah, they're going, you know, the 80s. Yes. Yeah. yes. Um, Basically, you know, I studied... Uh, you were hanging out with Sinead O'Connor, I'm sure, back in the I 80s. was, actually, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I actually shaved her head the first time. <laughs> <laughs> and afterwards, I looked at her and I said, Sinead, nothing. <laughs> to you. Yes. Uh, and she ran with that, obviously. That's and, awesome. Uh, <laughs> Turned yeah. it into a pretty good career. I was, no, yeah. I was a liar about that. Did. Yes, yes. So I, yeah, I, I did my teacher training in Ireland, and um, and then I taught for a year, and I absolutely hated it, um, with an incredible passion. Um, <laughs> what, and, uh, what age group was it that first year? Um, so they were um, so it was secondary school in Ireland. So I had a couple of classes of like that fourteen, fifteen, and then I had a couple of seventeen-year-old classes. Mm-hmm. The mm-hmm. problem was. My younger brother was in the uh, sort of senior class of 17, oh, 18 year old. No. And, um, and I was 21. Mm-hmm. And in Ireland, of course, you can drink in bars at 18. Yeah. But nobody cares because we don't have ID. 
right. really drinking bars from 15. Right. If you're old enough to so, ask for it, you can have it, basically. Yeah. So that was part of the problem. I'd be running into students everywhere. Um, yeah. You know, and I was, I was too young. I wasn't prepared. So I, so I took it very badly, and, uh, and, and I emigrated. That's how bad my teaching experience. <laughs> um, I'm going to another country. Yeah. yeah, and I came to Florida. I thought that that's it for me. You know? That's a good so, punishment to give yourself, I think. <laughs> yeah, thank thank you. Yeah, yeah. I thought, you know, the Catholic school upbringing, the sackcloth and ashes kind of thing. You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So I came over here, and then I kind of drifted for a few years, and then I woke up one morning in Jackson, Mississippi, and I thought I got to do something with my life. You know, you wake up in Mississippi. <laughs> You gotta do something with your life. You know? is, there goes all our Mississippi listeners. Okay, go ahead. So yeah, so I came back. I came back to St. Augustine, Florida, and I think '97, and uh, I got a job teaching at a, a middle school in a, a lovely little community called Ponte Vedra, and uh, that was it. Okay, and so you teach what subjects? So I teach English at the high school level now. I okay, did, I taught English for 15 years at the middle school, and then yeah, eight years ago moved on to high school. Okay, and you, do you like high school better? Yes and no. You can have more fun humor-wise with the high schoolers. But mm-hmm. I, think, mm-hmm. I think you make more of a difference at that middle school uh, okay. level. Okay. You know, I teach um, I teach IB and AP English, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and you know, it's a lot of foreign-born kids or first-generation kids. You know, their motivation is pretty much set. Right. And it was a little bit different getting a sixth grader or a seventh grader who you know, hadn't quite been turned on editing yet. Yeah. Yeah, I fully agree. And I think it just comes down to like the reasons why people teach. Like, I don't think any person's more or less of a teacher than anybody else, but like, I prefer working in middle school than to seniors. Cause the first time I ever got to teach seniors, you know, they're 17 to 19 years old. Like, yeah. so I, I'd look at them and go like, Hey guys, here's a handout, do it. And they'd go, okay. And then I wouldn't know what to do with myself. Like, I was, what do I do now? Like in middle school, that would have been an hour long argument. And so I'd at least have something to do. Yeah. Yeah. I miss yeah. yeah. I found that during the, uh, the, the initial run here of, uh, of COVID-19 when I had a senior class and obviously they'd cancel a lot of the exams. Mm-hmm. So the kids are doing absolutely nothing. Yeah. Part of my job was calling their houses and, and getting their parents on the phone and saying, you know, can you get Jeremy out of bed to do his, to do his work? And I'd have mothers whispering, he doesn't like me to disturb him. <laughs> I would say, yeah, but it's, it's two o'clock in the afternoon. Um, <laughs> but he was not asking you to knock night. on Picasso's workroom. Like, yes, <laughs> yeah. yes, you know, yes. <laughs> but eventually the moms would give me, you know, get him on the phone and, you know, you'd hear Jeremy screaming at his mother and get out of my room and go on, mom. And then I'd get on the phone and I'd be like, oh, hey, Mr. Carl, yeah, I'm real sorry. I'll, I'll get on that right away. Um, <laughs> She didn't want to disturb him. It was two o'clock in the afternoon. God forbid. Mm-hmm. I understand. It's the resting hour. The it is. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. It's difficult. Like if you, you know, if you've been in bed for twelve hours, you you need a little more because you get yeah. tired from sleeping. I, I there mean, are definitely days where I wake up from like a really rough night of sleep, and I think, man, I need a nap. So <laughs> why not throw one in? Yes. It sounds good to me. Yes, I'm I'm ready to take one now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See y'all later. <laughs> all right so uh derek uh i heard you use like a lot of comedy in your classroom yeah i i, I tried to um so I, I i found early on that one of the ways you could really get the kids into what you were doing um if you could tell a, an interesting story to connect it from the start mm-hmm. you know there's just <laughs> there's no way you can make some things interesting if you just you know you just pull it out like so I would try to tell stories about, you know, maybe some of the poets or some of the, the ways they met. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember teaching romantic poetry early on and, and, and telling the kids that, you know, that if Percy Shelley was alive today, you know, he'd make rock stars nervous with his behavior. <laughs> and, you know, I sort of go on from there and say, like, you know, this guy got kicked out of college for writing about, you know, a pamphlet called The Necessity of Atheism. They said, imagine today writing something like, you know, the necessity of atheism. And I said, and he got disowned by his family and his first wife killed herself. And then he exiled himself from England because he was sick and tired of the government. You know, his second wife was Mary Shelley and 
She wrote Frankenstein because they're all in Switzerland. They're all high on opium. <laughs> the kids, you know, their eyes are now, you know, mm-hmm. right. their eyes are massive. Yes. And then you go, oh, and he wrote some pretty good poems, too. So <laughs> he was using some of his poems. Yes. You know, that kind of stuff. Like, you talk about Lord Byron, and you're like, well, you know, once he, uh, he traveled around Spain on a, on a horse for a year. I don't know, because he wanted to. <laughs> it's, the, it's the connection with the story that gets them going. Mm-hmm. And then from there, you can, you know, you can pretty much introduce anything you want once yes. you get them hooked with the story. You know, it's that, that sort of backdoor into the learning process. Yeah. And if you can get, without getting in trouble, drugs and sex into the classroom. I into mean, the stories in the classroom. Let's specify. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I probably, Guys, guess what's in this baggie? No, that's... <laughs> I probably... Pushed now, it. This is cocaine, <laughs> and this is methamphetamine. Yes, you can tell the yes. difference by smelling them. Yes, we're gonna take it around, pass it, make sure you share. But I try and do that as much as I can as well. Here's where I get into the unprofessionalism. But we had this thing with um, absolute value, and it has to do with absolute value inequalities. And basically, what happens is you make this equation, and it creates. Um, a range of things. So the boring way is to talk about, oh, at a factory you're making this bolt and the bolt has to be 0.3 centimeters, but it can be off by 0.04 centimeters plus or minus. Okay? So I ask the most outgoing, thinks he's um, a player, young man. So you like the young ladies, yes? So what's the shortest and tallest young ladies that you like? You know what I mean? And we or we, we try and get into, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I'm i not trying to get, we're not getting into weight because that, that gets, that does get problematic. But I think, I think, you know, but all of a sudden now the class that doesn't care about absolute values and stuff like that, they want to know how short a girl he'll date and how tall a girl he'll date. Yeah. And and now we can do the math and start getting into that. So that definitely, whenever you can get something engaging, and if you can make it where they feel like you're being edgy, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, then, then that then that's good, even if you aren't being edgy. And, just and you From know. a psychological standpoint, uh, humor does activate the memory. Yeah. A kid will come to me and remember the funny things that happened in class, but they'll remember the book that we spent two months on. Yes. You know? Yes. The- I would, um, I remember I think whenever I would introduce certain authors, but for some reason, uh, W.B. Yeats worked with this book. Whenever I would say Yeats, I would jump on the podium. Nice. And it was one of those, one of those things that came to me. It was like, it's one of those days and nobody's paying attention. And I'm like, I, I yell the word Yeats and jump on the podium. <laughs> and, Everybody now associates, you know, it happens to me today. Like I'm, I'm in a barn. A guy who's in his early thirties will walk up to me and just scream Yates and jump on a table. And like, nice. But then he will freely admit, I don't remember anything else from your class. <laughs> that one. That oh one. yeah. No, uh, we'll have like read Ernest Hemingway and my students won't remember anything about it, but they'll remember the story I told where Ernest Hemingway was at his favorite bar and ripped a urinal out of the wall. And mm-hmm. as he was walking out, he said to the bartender, I pissed away so much money in here, I earned this. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> like, that encapsulates Hemingway pretty well, I think. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think it does. Yeah. yeah. I think it really does. So but when I say he, James Joyce hangs out with him, and they would get into bar fights together, like, like they understand. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I stayed up last night and drank some absinthe and played knife games, you know? <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> you know, as one does. As one does. But it's yes. essential like that. If you can, if you can get the kids understanding that authors, playwrights, writers of any, that they were people. Yes. That they had lives. And yeah. that they did stuff. Going back to the sort of romantic poetry, I tell the kids that when Samuel Taylor Coleridge wanted to meet William Wordsworth, he walked over to his house. <laughs> and that's kind of cool, except it was 43 miles away. Right. <laughs> and Coleridge didn't have a horse. And so if he wanted to see Wordsworth, he had to walk over the Quantock Hills and show up. What would have happened if Wordsworth wasn't home that day? Like, or he just leave? Like, is that what he goes to? All right, I'll come back tomorrow, you know? Like, he walks 43 miles, he shows up, Wordsworth's in the garden, and then he stays for three weeks. Mm-hmm. They meet, they hang out, he stays for three weeks, and they write lyrical ballads, and it changes all of literature for the next couple of hundred years. <laughs> but 
telling the kids, yeah, so he walked to his house 43 miles. Kids today are like, he, he walked? <laughs> yes. Yes, you know when you leave the house, you're <laughs> going somewhere. <laughs> yes. You know that thing you, you do on the way to cars? Yeah. <laughs> Quite the hajj. Yeah. Oh, For them, that's what it is, you know. It's it's good too because like you take stuff from you know this this lofty area of academia that's usually so like you know dusty and and brocaded and and idealistic. Brocaded is that a thing? Yes, brocaded, yeah. I'm really sure. Your mom's and face is brocaded. What does that mean to this? You're brocaded. <laughs> All right. So, uh, and, do you know what it means, or do you just use it to sound cool. smart? It has to do with the stiff collars that they would wear. Oh, okay. Oh, right. Am, I am I wrong? Am I wrong? I'm just wrong? thinking of my frat bro, Cocade. <laughs> <laughs> my bro. Yeah. Brocade, yes, that's true. Yeah, I hadn't <laughs> thought about that. Okay. All right. I, anyway, I, sorry I to disco. Back to, your, back to your whatever you were going to say <laughs> before I interrupted you with my brocade. If you take it from fancy land... Mm-hmm. And you bring it to Earth, they like it more. So, yeah, when I would introduce them Shakespeare, and like, of course, we would say, "Oh, Shakespeare," and we have to handle him with nice gloves because he's so fancy, and wonderful. And I point out, I'm like, "Yeah, the reports say he was probably a pothead, and I'm pretty sure he cheated on his wife a bunch, and wrote about it a lot, yeah. and uh, in his will wrote down to my wife, I leave my second best bed." Yeah. You know, nice. suddenly, they, like, they can put a character to him and start looking for, oh, is this sexist? Yeah, probably. Nice. Yeah. 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 And I need to get more details, but I don't know if you guys know this or not. Um, you've heard of Pythagoras, the Pythagorean theorem, but he literally was a cult, and he ran, like, a oh, cult. Yeah. So there was, like, a Pythagorean cult that was going crazy. on. crazy. He yes. throw out his nails really long, and, like, this cult, like, worshipped beans or something like that. Yeah. Well, yes. And everybody had to stand at right angles to each other in the room. <laughs> nice. <laughs> really, which, yeah. which is yes. rough, because protractors weren't invented yet. Oh, so wow. They just had to keep he, guessing. He invented <laughs> social distancing before. <laughs> <laughs> Math, mathematicians have been social distancing for a very long time, yes. Yes. Now, Derek... Vigetti said that you did stand up, but then you said that you didn't do stand up. So, have you actually done like open mic stand up or been something? So, clarify that for me. The truth is somewhere in the middle. I mean, I would love to tell you that Vigetti is a liar. And, um, <laughs> you know what? I'm just going to say that Vigetti is a liar. Um, but no, I, I do. Um, it's 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 comedy storytelling. Really, is what it is. Okay. Um, it's kind of like stand up, but it's more of a I'm going to tell a story and there's going to be some laughs in here or okay. or huge pockets of silence and sadness. Uh, um, are you familiar with The Moth on? Um... Yes, indeed. I actually have a former student of mine helped run The Moth. OK. OK. Yeah. For those of you who don't know, The Moth is an awesome podcast. Tedisco is looking around like, oh. Can I and let me tell my moth moth joke in a minute. So no, but the moth is a podcast to disco. You would really like it. It's basically, they curate, collect storytellers, and they do it at you know, kind of like little you know coffee houses and and Mm -hmm. stuff like that. And it's interesting. It's can be emotional. It can be funny, and all of those things. So give us more details on what you have done, how you do it, and then share one with us. Oh, Jesus, share one? Um, yeah, that's, that's, why we're, um, that's why we give pay you the big money. <laughs> I'm completely and totally unprepared for that. So I used to do some theater, and then I met a, a lovely half-man loon of a woman whose kid <laughs> happened to be in my class. She would invite people over to her house and just have performances, and people would oh, have music. Oh, and like a would, salon, as the, as, as, they, as the kids did back in the day. She called them soirees. Oh, cool. And, I can't spell that. And they would fly us with liquor and we would, you know, tell stories or do scenes or whatever. But then um, it became a little hip and cool in the uh, sort of Ponte Vedra area. Mm -hmm. So people would invite us to their houses to put this stuff on. Okay. And we always had one token random black guy who happened to be this guy called Al Letson. He did State of the Reunion on on NPR. And now he does Reveal on NPR. He's an extraordinary journalist. Wow. Um, and so Al was performing. He had a couple of one-man shows, and we go watch Al perform, and it's sort of like, okay, I, I could probably do that. <laughs> um, you know, because humility, obviously, <laughs> coursing through my body. Um, and so it kind of started from there. I, uh, I would sort of go tell some stories at some, you know, little small little clubs, and then I uh, developed it into a one-man show, and then I've done probably seven or eight different one-man shows. 
a lot of it is because I have a really dark, uh, messed up childhood and I can't afford therapy. Nice. Uh, and <laughs> I tell stories about my parents and my family and growing up in Ireland and emigrating and coming to America and all of that kind of stuff. So do you do this in the classroom as well, or this is separate from the classroom? Separate from the classroom, yeah. Okay, because it's a little too dark for the kids? Yeah, too dark or... Too personal? Too personal, yeah. Plus, as I say to the kids, you know, I do what I do in the classroom pretty much for free. (laughs) So, I earn some money outside of it. So, do you have like a little three-minute piece you can? If you can't, that's okay, or you can always... Um, One of the first ones I ever wrote was is a true story but uh you know about my parents and they had an incredibly dysfunctional relationship Mm -hmm. they absolutely they hate each other they're they're both in their 80s right now they rarely speak to each other but they live in the same house and they they've never gotten divorced because they're catholic that's that's very irish catholic but they absolutely despise each other um you know you go home for christmas you know and my mother talks to my father through me (laughs) <laughs> it's really disconcerting. Like, I remember the first time I took my wife to Ireland, and my mother says things like, tell your father to open the window. And my father says things like, you know, tell your mother if she wants the window open, she can do it yourself. Tell your father if he speaks to me like that again. And they're sitting across from me. <laughs> oh, God. And my wife is just incredibly <laughs> tense and anxious. Oh, yeah. And they speak to each other in that way, you know. Pass the butter. If you want the butter, get up off your lazy, fast arse and walk. You know, it's this... <laughs> This is glorious insanity, you know? That sounds, yeah, so, that sounds both uncomfortable and possibly amusing in the from the outside. and the and back end. After yeah. From the outside yeah. it is. So I, one of the stories I put together initially uh, when I was doing this thing was, um, I said, you know, I grew up in a house that was the absolute antithesis of feng shui. <laughs> if there were ways that furniture alignment could blacken a mood or retard social development or drain a house of comfort and balance and everything that should be in a home, then my mother was master of the home. <laughs> she had a remarkable ability to always put a chair in the wrong place. And she could not conceive of any other opinion but her own. She wallpapered everything. <laughs> she even wallpapered our school group in great swirly floral patterns that she had found in Norwegian interior design catalogues that only she had read. (laughs) She tiled all the floors in the kitchen, the bathroom, but then she carpeted her bedroom, and she carpeted the ensuite bathroom in her bedroom, but we weren't allowed to use that one, ever. And so this crazy, wonderful upbringing in my house where my mother had stuff in the house that we couldn't use. We couldn't walk on the car. <laughs> we could only use the bathroom with the tile. But my mother didn't believe on turning on the heat. So in winter, the floors were arctic. Mm. The story goes on and on. It's a bit of a shaggy dog story. But it ends up my mother wanted my father to get up on a Saturday morning and paint the kitchen. And these would be the kind of things my mother would just come up with, like paint the kitchen or paint the outside of the house. Little segue here. We once painted the outside of our house four times in three years. Oh, because <laughs> just on a whim, your mom was just like, "We're painting." Yeah. I want. To, well, she would say, "We we're going to paint the house," which meant my father and my brother and I would be painting the house. <laughs> right that way. Yeah. So mom so is either pa- really about- really passive aggressive, or she maybe has both. some mental health challenges, or both. 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 <laughs> But her passive aggressivity was was kind of violent at the same time, too. You know? mm. So my father, I came into the kitchen this one Saturday morning, and you know, the sun is drifting in. It's this beautiful harvest yellow color. My father is paint speckled at the table and drinking a cup of coffee. And I'm looking, I'm going, Jesus, Dad. Like, genuinely impressed. And then as I go over to, you know, my dad, like, well, make me a cup of tea there. And I, I pull the kettle away from the wall, and I'm filling up the kettle with water, and then I get the toaster pulled away from the wall. I'm putting some bread into it, and as I'm depressing the on button, I realize there's something wrong with the wall. And I look back, and the newspaper is shaking in my father's hand. And what I realize is he's painted around every single thing in the kitchen. He's painted around the kettle, the toaster, the 
Oh my goodness. There was a spice rack on the wall. Oh my god. Delicate touch of an old master. My father painted around each. Oh wow. (laughs) Nice. Painted on all the pictures. There was a sacred heart picture of Jesus painted on that antique cheese board. All these like criminally homo figurines that my mother had on a shelf. He painted around the homo figurines. Wow. And so that was that was his passive aggressive way of yeah. saying, you know what? Normally, you would, I would take a lot of time and energy to move all these things, but instead, this is my little, you know, stick it to you. And that's the kind of stuff that went on. You know? <laughs> and it took my mother about two or three days to realize it, and then you know, just murder, absolute murder. Oh. But um, so yeah, there's a lot of that kind of stuff. And my mother would do things like she would want my father to plant things in the yard, and my father hated planting. But my mother would want things, and she would just be adamant about what he would do it. But then two weeks later, when he was mowing the lawn, he'd just mow everything out of the way. Oh, jeez. <laughs> it was this ongoing, oh, insane wow. behavior. Goodness. Yes. They yeah. either need a reality show or possibly a, a sitcom that is that is written um, about them. Because it, it, that sounds both both troubling and enter- wow. entertaining at the, at the same time. Oh, okay. Nice. So kind of related to this, my, my moth joke is almost related to that. Um, oh dear. By the way, normally I say stop me if you've already heard this, but don't, but don't stop me. Just shut up and let me tell it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so a moth goes into an optometrist's office and the moth says, listen, I'm having trouble with my wife. I don't really love her anymore. We don't communicate. We're not intimate. We're having these issues and the kids. I kind of care about them, but I have trouble expressing my love for them. And I just have nights where I can't sleep. I've got anxiety. I just have all this issues. When I go into work, I just don't feel fulfilled. And I don't like my job. And I'm just having all these kind of problems. The optometrist turns to the moth and says, this is an optometrist office. It sounds like what you really need is like a psychologist. Like, why did you come in here instead of the psychologist's office? The moth goes, well, the light was on. <laughs> just, <laughs> just waves of sadness. <laughs> I do love that joke a lot. <laughs> Norm, so Norm MacDonald did a version of that joke oh, on Conan O'Brien that lasted like seven minutes. Nice. Like him nice. just going on and on as this moth just like explaining all the horrible details of his life in the most oh, dramatic fashion yes well, all right so we're gonna we're gonna bring it back to teaching here bring it um, back to get away from stand up stand up is, is cool it's something i've always wanted to say that i have done but not something i've ever wanted to do and i'd be really afraid of ever doing comedy like that because i think it would break the first rule of the podcast Mealy, what's the first rule of the podcast don't get fired don't get fired so i'm i think good rule yeah <laughs> Yeah. Yes. You mentioned uh, uh, before we got on that you have tenure. There, there's there's no such thing as tenure here, and you can get you can be fired. You know. Well, we've, we've talked about it before. It's kind of it's kind of hard to get fired, but but we don't want to get fired. Yeah. yeah so we just, get away with tenure in Florida, but about 15 years ago, I was lucky enough to be grandfathered in. So. Nice. The problem with that is that you get you get picked to be the person to speak to administration all the time. Oh yeah. Even if it's not your issue. Even yeah. Part, you know, people will come to you and go. So, Listen, <laughs> I can't say this because, but you can. And I'm like, so we're getting, you want me to ask for lacrosse uniforms for the girls team? <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's your wheelhouse. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Huge fan of lacrosse. Obviously. Right. Yes. Yeah. Oh Start my off goodness. with a joke about Percy Shelley and then just segue into the lacrosse. <laughs> Shelly was a lacrosse fiend. Jeez. <laughs> Man loved his lacrosse. That's true. All right. So I'm, I'm really curious how, you, how you're going to answer this question. So you get two wishes. You can either, you can add one thing to the education universe, or as we call it, the eduverse around here, or you s- subtract one thing, and you can have one of each, or you can add two. You, you've got liberty, but th- that's your um, your prompt there. Can, can my answer to subtract just be... Betsy DeVos. <laughs> I guess I guess that can be that can be your your your, um, your subtract. Sure, we can. We I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole, but Betsy, yes. if you're listening. 
Yes, I'm sure so, she's 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 she's, she's not. She's, <laughs> you I don't think the perception I, on the yacht. Probably. By the way, <laughs> Betsy, Betsy DeVos and listening not often said in the same sentence. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so seriously, if I could add something or subtract something or both. Um, well, adding something, obviously, a, a real living wage would be kind of spectacular. That would mm-hmm. be cool. Yeah, I would like that. I have two real big pet peeves in education, and one of them is um, the concept of the PLC, the Professional Learning Community. Mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. cannot tell you how much I hate professional learning communities. Really? <laughs> People come in to explain to me how important they are. <laughs> you know, it's the standard, the guy comes in with a PowerPoint and spends eight hours telling you that PowerPoint is the worst way to teach. <laughs> That kind of stuff. And I could probably handle them if they were just, you know, at the start of the year and maybe one in-service day a year. But we're now required to do them every week. Mm -hmm. Um, And are you required to meet for a certain amount of time? Yeah, you are required to meet. So I spend an extraordinary amount of time finding ways not to meet and making up minutes for meetings that never happen. Right. Sometimes my meetings are so creative that they then ask me, to do some of these things that I've completely made up for meetings. <laughs> so That's PLC. the fun thing. Being unprofessional is going to say, and you sound like you've done this. We have a lot of redundant paperwork as teachers. Some of it, the person that's telling you to do it is being told by someone else to do it who's being told by someone else to do it. It comes and down no from one, the Department of Redundancy Department. Yeah. And no one yeah. other than the person at the top that read an article or saw a thing that says, hey, this is how we fix this. They then tell the superintendent that tells the principal that tells the department chair that tells... That well, they have to paint the kitchen white. Yeah, they, they, Exactly. I, and I so my, um... the fun part is, Tedisco might do this some, I've done it more than once, is to put absolute nonsense on that and turn it in and see whether or not Anyone says boo. A few years ago, we were asked, uh, our school district moved to this whole Marzano model of, um, you know, observation and reflection and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And our district wanted us then to, you know, expand on that ourselves and come up with our own scales and our own number system and our own rubrics. And <laughs> I'm thinking, this is insane. Said, we have all of this in, in the books that Marzano wrote. Why would we recreate the wheel? You're telling us this is the wheel. They said, yeah, but we want you to individualize it. But then when you individualize it, share with the group so we can maybe work on this together. So I got annoyed and I started to go down the rabbit hole. I started reading some of Marzano's books and I realized that he was referring in his latest book to his previous book. So they go to the previous book and he was referring. So he was, there was an awful lot of self-referential stuff in the books that he was using to justify where he was. Mm -hmm. So then I discovered that he didn't write his books. I discovered that they're ghost written by a woman. So then I found who she was. So I contacted her. And wow. I her and said, hey, we're asked to do this in our school district. Can you tell me, where did you get your rubrics and scales from? And she says, oh, we just stole them from AP. <laughs> <laughs> so I went back to my school district and went to a meeting downtown and said, look, I'm not doing this. And here's why I'm not doing it. Because the people whose book you hold up with the Bible have now admitted to me that they basically are just using the AP stuff. So what if we just use the AP stuff? They did not take that well. Yeah. <laughs> wow. A little, you know. Maybe there's a passive aggressive gene that you've inherited. Yeah, it is a little bit of that. Because um, <laughs> that's a lot of work. You did like twice as much work as like making a rubric just to prove you didn't have to do a rubric. Yes. <laughs> I don't want to put in an hour of work, and I'm going to put in a hundred hours of work just to prove it. Yeah, yeah. But for that reason, sometimes now administrators they just I walk into the room and there's this like, oh Jesus, Christ. <laughs> and I feel good about that. That is good. That is good. I feel good energy. Dad. So I got called on doing it one time. So a lot of times, also after this stuff, you're given a survey, a form to fill out. They want feedback from you. So we had this training and the person doing the training says out loud, this doesn't need to take as nearly as long as we're going to take on this. (laughs) And I'm like, what? (laughs) This 
doesn't need to take as long as we're going to take. Did I, did I hear that right? And I, I scribble that down. And so we're given this feedback form. They're like, what did you think about the training? And I put that quote there and I said, this person said this. We have X amount of time in the day. And if you're going to literally make things take longer than they need to take on purpose and then admit it to me while I sit there and waste my time, I don't like that. And then I got called into the admin's office and was like, well, are you an expert on whatever the topic that was being taught? I'm like, no, I'm not an expert on that. But that's what she said. She knew that she could like explain it to us in three minutes, but we're going to go through all these activities and rigmarole and nonsense because we're supposed to have an hour-long training, X amount of times, X amount of semesters, and all that kind of stuff. And that's where it is with the PLC. Meeting is a good thing. Talking and reflecting is a good thing. And, and doing a group it, of people to, to brainstorm with is great. Yeah. Right. Doing it for the sake so that you can check a box and because it's Thursday. That's the madness. <laughs> yeah. That's the madness. We had a, when I was at the middle school, uh, we had a guy from Iowa and uh, he was an extraordinary math teacher. And he was just, if you could have drawn up the stereotypical Iowa farm boy look, he looked like, remember the show in the 70s, The Greatest American Hero? Yes. Remember He looked like, but he would always get poor observations, classroom observations, particularly mm-hmm. from new admin. They'd come in because he wasn't teaching math the right way. Whatever the hell that meant. Right. But this guy had a math degree. But then they couldn't figure out his kids were not only doing better than everybody else in the district, but they were doing better than everybody else in the state. On the yeah. And the admin they couldn't admit that they were wrong with the class evaluation, but then they would find other ways to explain how he was doing this. Instead of just going, hey, why don't you teach everybody what you're doing? Right. And But they would double down on, well, yes, but imagine how successful he would be if... No. And he would just... But he was too nice to say anything because Iowa Farm Boy. Iowa, yeah. Wow. Well. Yeah, it's, it's Superman um, does come from the Midwest. Yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I, I know what you mean to, because yeah, the, there were times and I, I was put in charge of one PLC. It was uh, uh, so bad it kind of destroyed our entire department. But like oh, well we would have these meetings where you know I'd sit with everybody, and be like, "All right, yeah, no, I think we're good. Like we don't really have anything to discuss this week because we did a whole lot of work last week." And Edmund would still tell us to meet, and I'd write down as our objective a uh, dog and pony show. Nice. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And nobody nobody checks. Nobody knows. Nobody cares. Right. As long as and that's the play, as long as they're ticking off the boxes. Yes. Um, yeah. But I will tell you, I went last summer. I had to um, re up my IB training. And every five years, minimum five years you've got to be trained. And I'd kind of been avoiding it. And they basically told me I'd turned the five years into seven years. And they they said to me, Look, if you don't go to the damn training down in Tampa, you can't teach IB anymore. And I said, Okay. Um what if I don't do it in Tampa? Because I'm going to be traveling in Europe. What if I find a place in Europe and I go to a conference there? So they let me do it. So we were, I was over to wife and kids and we happened to be in the Netherlands. So I found an IB conference in The Hague and I went to that. And there was probably four or 500 people there, 67 different countries represented. Wow. Wow. But the really interesting was three of us from America. There's people from Uzbekistan, people from Rwanda, Burundi. Uruguay, like just, you know, all places that no American has heard of or could find. Other than a risk board, yeah. (laughs) And the extraordinary thing was everybody else that was at this conference had been flown there and had their accommodation paid for. They were all staying in five-star hotels. Nice. Three Americans. We were all there on our own dime. (laughs) (laughs) Which was crazy. But Mm -hmm. the second thing that was really brilliant about it was at the end of every day's session, they had an open bar for an hour and a half for all the teachers. Wow. And What? Yeah. And and it was whatever you wanted to drink and as much as you could consume in the hour and a half. Wow. Challenge accepted. <laughs> Again, talking with the other two Americans, we were like, could you imagine anything like this happening in America? At the end of a day of some kind of a conference. Okay, open bar, lads, down there. Knock yourselves out. And I'm and I'm gonna venture to say you learned something at the open bar 
that you actually applies to education. Yes! <laughs> Absolutely. And see, <laughs> and that is why, even though we are not currently drinking and I, I, I don't drink, but that's what I know, you know, like it, one of the taglines of the thing is like it's the conversations you have in the bar room, the coffee house and the um, work room, because it's when teachers talk like that, like that was a PLC meeting. And you're, but like you can learn and you hear and you, and you share and all those kind of things. And so if admin, if you don't hear anything else, if you happen to be listening to this podcast, no, the teachers want to be better. And the way we're better is when we talk to each other and we'll get better Without the structure, you yeah. know, we'll give us, give us freedom and time and maybe just a, a teensy bit of structure right. and we will teach each other the stuff that we know and make ourselves better teachers. Oh yeah. Planning. Give me, give me, a, give me a little more planning time during the day. Right. Quit taking my planning time away. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And stuff like that. But it, it does. You go out and you, you know, and that's why I, I wanted to start this podcast because I knew that there would be there was conversations I've had in so many different places, different times. I'm like, wow, that what you just told me in that five minutes, how I'm going to now use that as my classroom management or my assessing or the 9000 teachery buzzword things we do is so much better than the seven hour thing that I sat through. It's like thing. one of those many times where like, yeah, yeah, that drunk guy from Burundi had a really good point. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Friend of mine. He had a go-to thing at parties where he would ask people at parties, if you could get away with it, who are three people you would kill? Oh, my goodness. Somebody <laughs> you would know. That's an icebreaker. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. Great icebreaker, right? And people would always, people had a list. So many people were really disturbing because it was somebody from high school and they knew where they lived and they tracked Ooh. them down on Facebook, right? Really disturbing. Wow. Always made for fascinating conversation. Well, I was coming home one evening after one of these events and it dawned on me like I had a really difficult, a difficult class. Um, sort of English for seniors, not motivated, tough to get them going. And I went in on the Monday and said, look, okay, I want you to write a paper about three authors, three poets, three people you've studied in your high school career that you wish you'd never heard of that you, you could kill metaphorically um, and give me an essay on why these people shouldn't be taught anymore, why they shouldn't be alive, why they need to be dead. And I got the most brilliant essays. Wow. And the anger that flowed out of them. Yes. And the quality of writing was, it was just incredible. And the voice that they gave me, mm-hmm. but it was just allowing them to vent a little bit mm-hmm. and to say, oh my God, I hate this. That's yes. brilliant. This person needs to be gone and they need to be taken out the back and why any, and fantastic stuff. We need to invent a time machine now so we can go back and kill Shakespeare. <laughs> that kind of stuff. So it's it's moments like that, that that I love about teaching that you can incorporate in. But again, having to meet for a mandated PLC for one hour every Thursday because that's what we do every Thursday because I have to tick the box and you have to tick the box and somebody has to see that I tick the box, that you tick the box. That's when we that's when we lose the whole point of it. We lose the beauty of it, we lose the madness of it, we lose the fun of it. Mm-hmm. We do. Um, that's awesome. Tied to that, I did something not exactly like that, but similar to that. I like as a icebreaker the first week to do different things, kind of team building and just kind of getting to know each other. So this and this was some older kids. So we did a draft. I'm I'm a big fantasy football guy. So I teach them how how to do a draft where you're drafting and doing round robin drafting or whatever the draft was a battle royale and you got to pick from the staff of teachers who you wanted as your team that you thought would be able to beat up the other teachers and the kids like talk about being engaged discussing like why teacher x was like going to be tough or why this one would fight dirty and why this one was like she's small but she's feisty Right. And all these different things and like who they would like on their team. And it was just so much fun. And when you can kind of just take it, do something different and creative. And all of a sudden the kids are like, Oh, this is, this is so much fun. And they don't even realize that they're learning and that they're using critical thinking and all these things that they're, they're, they're problem solving. They're doing all these things that you want kids to do. If they come together for that moment for the, that day or the two days of that lesson, you have them realistic for the next two or three months. Mm-hmm. 
Yes. I used to bring in a guy, um, a guy called Chris Bolu, and I used to get um, grants that used to be available. We used to bring Chris in every year at the start of the year, particularly for the English four seniors. And with pretty big high schools, about almost 3,000 students in it. Mm-hmm. And you have these guys who've been four years in high school, and they didn't know anybody. You know, you have a graduating class of about 700, 700. Yeah. So Chris would come in with me, and we would get these group of kids who've been in school together for four years, don't know each other. And we get them to jump rope. Then we get them to jump on a really big rope. And the whole goal was, can everybody, one of them, come in, jump three times and get out without falling, without tripping? Mm-hmm. And at the start of the week, and we would just, there was times this, you'd just be flipping the rope around for 30 minutes and nobody going in because everyone's afraid to mess up. And nobody knows who everybody is. But by the end of the week, you'd have classrooms going 10 times in a row. And the energy level and the screaming and the excitement. Mm-hmm. And then somebody finally fell on the 300 time jumping through. Everyone had collapsed on the floor. They're hugging each other. They're dancing. They're laughing. I could get them to do anything. Anything right. like that. Now, yeah. some administrators would be like, you've just wasted a week. And I'd say, well, maybe I'm not doing the curriculum for a week. But I know a classroom with 25 seniors who want to come to school every day. And they all know each other. Mm-hmm. And they all know something about each other. And they want to work together. So my yeah. job is now a hell of a lot easier. And I'm going to get more out of it. But we can't do that anymore because they cut all the grants. <laughs> 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 yeah. I did a... Quizzes, if you know what Quizzes is, and Kahoot, it's like Kahoot or whatever. But it's basically yeah. an online um, game. Oh, and the kids loved me and hated me because I know that the kids like you have a kid a class of like thirty kids, and it's three months in, and you go, go ask Ralph what the answer is. Who's Ralph? You've been in the same room for three months. I've said Ralph's name every day. So what I did was, we have on the grading software their school ID picture that was taken for their little photo ID they have to wear around school all the time. So I took those pictures and I made a quizies with the names and I would make up like, <laughs> I would make up funny names and the real name or some like version of their name. And, and we did that. And so then I said, okay, well, today, you know, we had like a, what we called an enrichment period. I said, today we're going to play this quizies and we're going to get to know each other. And the kids were laughing so much. Now, when they saw their own picture, they were so, like, embarrassed. And, oh, I can't believe you put that picture on me. But they were having so much fun when they weren't doing their own thing. And they got to know each other. And it's- you know, and, and, and again, it's little things about, you know, just building the classroom dynamic. And you got, you know, and this is another thing that I struggle with talking to, um, you know, admin and people like that, is that every class is different. Every classroom has a different dynamic. Yes. And... But I discovered pretty early on teaching middle school that if I wanted the kids to recite something, Mm -hmm. the automatic reaction was, oh, I can't do this. This sucks. But if you told them, you can recite it however you want. If you want to stand on my car in the parking lot and recite, you can do it. Mm -hmm. If you want to stand on your head, if you want to play leapfrog, if you want to do it on top of the desk, if you want to lie down on top of the lockers, Right. If you want to do stage combat while reciting, and suddenly <laughs> everybody wants to do the exercise. Yes. They try to top each other on, what bag of madness can I bring to this? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And not only do you get the desired result, but the camaraderie that exists then in the classroom. Yes. They come bouncing in. And they come bouncing in the next day, and then you've, you've turned the classroom completely backwards. But you don't let on. And you just teach as if nothing has happened. So you move the desks, everything. Move the whiteboards, put them on the opposite wall. It takes time. And mm-hmm. they walk in, you don't say anything. And you just teach. So I'm going to ask you a question now. Yeah. And this, this is a tough one. I don't know if you can answer it. But if you can, I'll be super impressed. So you make this effort. You build this camaraderie. They know each other now. Yeah. They love each other. How do you get them... To now listen when it's your turn to talk. How do you not <laughs> end up it becoming a party? I mean, I like yelling at people. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, right. um, you know, randomly pummeling one child. That's right. good. Yes, make an example. Yeah. Um, and flogging. I think, again, oh, yeah, flogging is superb. You know? <laughs> 
<laughs> Waterboarding is the best. Too, as well. That could be <laughs> You're in Florida. Yeah, just take a kid and have a stick a shark on him. I think it's um when you have that from the start, I think you've got to keep it going. I think it's your energy as well in a classroom. Mm -hmm. I'm a big believer in I move all the time in the classroom. I'm up and down the aisles. I'm talking to kids individually. I I will make an effort to be more energetic. I will jump around the place. I will try to bring some passion in and inject it when I'm talking, when I'm teaching. But I also let them know that it's difficult. There's no messing around. I said, look, you're going to have a lot of fun here, but it's going to be hard. Mm -hmm. And I don't give them any slack. And I've also discovered that if you just give the assignment once, right? I refuse to have a website. I don't want to put anything online. So if I tell you in class what the assignment is, do the assignment. If you don't do the assignment, nah, there's your grade. And what I've learned is that the kids really respect, oh, there isn't a second chance. Oh, there isn't a fail safe. Oh, I better do it. Oh, he's serious. And it's amazing. The first couple of weeks can be quite difficult. Yep. A parent, that, that first month's got to have a lot of tough conversations. A lot of admin conversations. But then once you get past that and everyone knows where the lines are, what the expectations are. I'm a big believer in the responsibility falls on the kids. Mm -hmm. It's kind of this weird idea, <laughs> you know, that yeah. it's like, I'm not at fault. But Strange. I think if you set the, if you set the tone and, and you're willing to make it difficult and keep it that way, and that's not saying like, I, I won't meet, you know, I'll meet with kids in the morning, we'll go over stuff, we'll... Right. They're, you're supporting the kids while you're holding them accountable. But it's it's energy level in the classroom. It's enthusiasm. It's It's, it's fun. But I think it's also knowing your subject, too. I think particularly for young teachers, it's very difficult to master the classroom management and know your subject, have the confidence. Yes. The kids can see through it very, very quickly. Yeah. They changed my content my second year, and it was basically like my first year over again because I'm a kid like, well, what if I did a problem like this? And I'm like, oh, uh, let's see what happens if you do it like that. But you know, I'm like, okay, this is where kids – start to feel you can i can build that confidence here's the stuff that will build the confidence here's the stuff that will make them really struggle and i can know i know how to space those out i, I have found that it's really miraculous when you turn to a group of kids and go hey i don't know <laughs> Yo, I, I don't know the answer to that question and you actually build a lot of rapport that way you do by saying i don't know let's look it up let's find out or i'll find yeah. out and ask yeah. me again tomorrow yeah the second year teacher i was scared to death to say that though if you don't know, you've got to be able to say, you know what, I don't know. Yeah. And if you're in a class like teaching, I taught gifted kids for 15 years. I teach IB kids. They're smarter than I am. <laughs> They're just teenagers. And you right. have to be okay with that. You have to be okay with saying like, yes, you know, you're, you're smarter than I am. You can't turn it into, and I think it happens sometimes, you know, we get annoyed at what we think are smart arse kids. And it's like, no, they're just smarter than us. Yes. And we have to be okay with that. And we have to be able to say, I don't know. Let's look it up. And you have to be vulnerable like that. You have to be okay with saying, mm -hmm. I don't have the answers. Yeah. And another thing I find is on, on days when they're struggling, they just abandon the, abandon the lesson for the day and let them talk. Yes. And some days, like, you just go, all right, what's on your mind? Come on, rant. No judgment. Just say what you want to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Last presidential election. There are a lot of days where I'm like, I feel like you guys just have a lot of pent up thoughts and I'm not going to express mine. But if you guys want to, this is safe space. We didn't get a lot of teaching done that day. Yeah, we had a, we had a um, protest at our school. This is um, it was a day without immigrants that, uh, about uh, three years ago, four years ago, whatever it was. It was a huge national thing. Um, so it must have been within it was, it was within Trump's presidency, I guess. But um, there was a day without immigrants. And then the, the following day at our school, there was a big thing. Uh, no, we just had a big conversation about it and how kids were feeling. And when you invest in the kids, then you can actually withdraw from that and go, listen, last week we did this. Today, I need you to like give me a little more than you normally give me because we need to get through this. So I need you, I need you to help each other. I'm going to need you to pay attention to me. We can't, I can't tell goofy stories. I can't dilly dally. You can't do this. And we kind of get there together and you build that family that we talk about we build that team that we build that where we're all on the same page i use the analogy sometimes what i can convince a kid it's not him versus me but it's me and him versus the content that yeah. we're going to conquer that and then that you kind of get that buy-in that we can do this together then it, it, it helps yeah and it is it, it's those things that really you know sometimes when we want all of us 
be teaching on the same page at the same time and have the same summative tests and the same oh. formatives. That's when me and some of our senior teachers, we go to the admin and go, okay, that doesn't work. The kids aren't robots. We're not robots. Yeah. Like, if you give us just this little bit of freedom for those days when we can connect with the kids, the race issues, the Confederate monuments, Black Lives Matter, we can talk about presidential politics. Those are the days that get you through the next two or three weeks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Those are the days that help you as a teacher as a, and as a human being. You know, and it, it is the connection you make with the kids. It was upsetting to me. I went to a job interview one time and the person interviewed me actually said, so this is how we do this here. Like almost the whole department was there and they said, we teach the same thing every day. They go, when I walk out of Mrs. Brown's room and she's in the middle of a sentence, I should be able to walk in Mrs. Green's room and hear the end of the sentence. And I'm like, have you taught? (laughs) I've had the same class that I'm teaching the same stinking topic three times in one day, one class. I got through it in this much time what a class like i'm like i can't do it with this i'm the same person teaching the same thing in the same room and if you walk in a minute 45 first block second block and third block we're going to be in a different place each time god for, how am i going to go with the one next Academy. door that's what they want i'm like you are crazy let me get you are insane with that nonsense like why what what did, why what did you don't want me get out of here <laughs> <laughs> And that's it. Like it, it goes back to the class dynamic. You've got people from all over, different backgrounds, different race, different genders. Someone's having a good day. Someone's having a bad day. You just don't know. Mm. And the idea that you can be on the same page, same word, lockstep. Yeah, craziness. All right, so we're getting towards the end here, and we've and we've, we've told a lot of good stuff. But is there any specific like? This is my go-to when I'm at the bar in um, Dubai getting my IV thing or whatever you are. They go, I want to make this guy from um, uh, Flanistan laugh really hard. Is Flanistan a place? Um, Thank you. It's funny. (laughs) But my go-to three-minute, I can't believe this happened in my classroom um, story. Hit us with one of those. Um, I remember, God, I'm trying to go back in the day here. We used to play this wonderful game. Vocabulary is so difficult to teach because it's so mind-numbingly boring. Yeah. But we would come up with this, we would devise this game called the box game, where the kids would put all the vocab words over the course of a week into a box. Then you'd pick teams. And there might be four teams in the classroom. And you'd come up with funny names to the team. And then the kids would have, every kid would have a minute to come up to the box, pull the word out. You couldn't say the word, but you could either give a definition or an explanation for the word. And then the team okay. that had the most points at the end. Like t- so taboo, you, again, basically. Yeah. You would have kids coming over the desks, <laughs> the answers, like the level of excitement in the room. And always it was like, if you want an individual one, we'll have a cupcake party. Whoever has the winning score, whatever team has the winning score at the end of the year, so you might have 10 of these competitions, we'll do a massive pizza party and you get to sit outside for class for the day. The level of competition, the level of intensity, their ability to know vocabulary, their ability to put it in sentences. And again, it's making it a little bit fun, making it a little bit of a game. We play uh, in my class, we do a game called Bowl of Nouns. Um, oh. So they put all the vocab words in a bowl. Mm-hmm. And so the first round, yeah, they can pull it out and they can describe it however they want without using the word. And whoever like guesses it gets the word. Yeah. Um, and then... The second round, they put all the same words, all the same vocab words back in. But this time, they can only say one word to describe it. And if nobody gets it, they just have to keep repeating that word until time runs out. And it drives them nuts. And then the third round, they can't say anything. So they have to act it out. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. But it's the same now. So they they have essentially... A list that they can like a, like that they can pull from. How many how many total nouns in the bowl? By the way, uh, usually like it depends on the vocab list, but usually anywhere okay. from ten to twenty. Okay, and yeah. when we when COVID is over, they will have bottomless bowl of nouns at um, the Olive Garden. I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, only. This broadcast <laughs> brought to you by Olive Garden. Thank Olive you. Garden. Thank mm, you. Food. Yes, mm, breadsticks. Oh, they do have that. And you don't and really like your family, but you gotta take him somewhere. 
All right. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up here. Is there anything else, Derek, that you wanted to um, share or it was on your mind or heart that you wanted to um, to say? Nothing that I could cover in 30 seconds. No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, we've yeah, really enjoyed awesome. having you. Um, thank you very much. And thank you, Steve yeah, Fagetti, again for um, introducing us and bringing us a guest. So we'll, I don't know how we'll reward Steve Fagetti other than just say his name a few more times. Oh, he's got yeah. a does physical therapy. It's um, it's got some kind of name of I don't know what it's called. <laughs> it's a place with a name. It's got a yeah. building. Yeah, if you're in Florida in uh, St. Augustine, I guess area, yeah. just Google uh, Vigetti physical therapy, and I'm I'm sure you can find him. He, you know, he's a he's an okay kind of guy. Yeah, he's yeah. a good guy. He's, he's yeah. a really he's a yeah. really good guy. He is. He is. Oh, can I tell a funny Steve Vigetti story? Yes. Okay, <laughs> this will be awesome and disgusting. So. <laughs> Steve Agetti. Oh, terrible avenue. Yes. So Steve Agetti had a girlfriend for a good while when we were in high school. Her name was um just let's just say Lisi. We don't want us to put her name out. But apparently they thought it was cute as high schoolers to share their gum. So they would like I remember multiple times them kissing. And now the other one is chewing the gum when they're done. <laughs> is this your thank you to Steve? <laughs> yes. Wow. I hate that's, to know what you do with your enemies. Steve but... Getty, that's what you're famous for now, okay? <laughs> you can email him at gumswap at gmail.com. Oh. <laughs> Oh, all right. So we'll end the podcast there. So thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you, Derek, for being here and stay unprofessional. <laughs> Thanks, gentlemen. Thank you again. Thanks for tuning in, unprofessionals. Next week, our guest is Aida Hadsevic. She's known for her Twitch account where she games and runs PDs. She does giveaways on Twitter. And she still finds time to teach full-time in New York City. Here's a little taste of the future with Aida Hatsevic. I think the lack of confidence that a lot of teachers have, like, towards their fifth year of teaching. Nice. Where they, they get really jaded. I don't mm -hmm. know yeah. if there's a better way to say it, but mm -hmm. they get really discouraged. They get really jaded. They get really discomforted by the fact that Maybe certain teachers are highlighted more in their schools than others. And that, that upsets me because everybody has something to offer. Mm -hmm. Everybody. Like, I, it doesn't matter what you do. You could be editing a video. You could be gaming. You could be doing an after school program. You could be doing phys ed. You could be doing running. You could be doing anything. And I think that there has to be a way to get that lack of confidence up. And I'm not saying everybody deserves a trophy. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is everybody deserves a chance to shine in a yes. way that is, is healthy, right? So it's like, you know what, if, if, uh, if Joanne or whatever the case is, or John has a specialty in like chess and they mm -hmm. want to teach someone how to, how to game in that way, right? Cause that is gaming, right? Mm -hmm. They're teaching them yep. critical thinking skills. They're teaching them problem solving skills. They're teaching them how to make decisions, right? They're teaching mm -hmm. them all these sorts of things. That teacher is gaining confidence through teaching. That mm -hmm. student's gaining confidence, and it's a win-win. And then also it's a win for the admin because now the admin has given them a chance to grow, and now they're complimenting the admin to the upper admin. So it's like everybody's winning. And yes. that it's very hard to get everybody to win, which is why I'm saying it's not going to be perfect. No. But that's one thing that I wish I could. Yeah. That is a, a good way. You know, you're, you're, you're trying to add, you subtract by adding, but I'm getting rid of that, the bitterness, the jadedness, the not feeling appreciated, which uh, there are a lot of teachers who do not feel appreciated. They're doing just, you know, crazy good things. And, and you're right. You know, you can get a little too like participation trophy some point, like, Oh, we're just going to like, you know, it's, you know, teacher of the week and all that kind of stuff. And there's, and there, that can be done well and it can be done poorly. But, um, and, we talked to uh, someone else, you know, Robert Kaplinsky or whatever, but he was on um, an earlier episode and the Observe Me mo movement. Are you, are you familiar with that, Aida? Yeah. And if, you, if you're if you not familiar with that, you can look him up or go, listen to our podcast that he was on. But we do. Teachers need their batteries recharged. There's various ways that that needs to happen. And I think sometimes, whether it's the public, whether it's upper admin, whether it's the, um, the admin in your school, 
sometimes they lose sight and not that they aren't because I think they have good intentions that like if we can make the teachers happier then the, the learning will take place you know what I mean yes the students are the reason that we're all there but if you can focus on the teachers and make them feel good then they will in turn take that energy and it will be get relayed to the students uh, and sometimes sorry, it gets Billy. I can't collect any data on happiness so <laughs> we can't push that okay <laughs> That's true. I apologize. I you know, almost did a spit take. That was yes. I really did. I poorly couldn't. timed on my part. <laughs> 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 I'm trying to I give some snark inspiration. That. Yes, yes. Oh. Anyway, all right. So we got a couple more things we want to, we want to cover here, but that, that's that's an excellent point to discuss. I, I forget that I ever said that. <laughs> no, Al- already forgotten. <laughs> but um, so. I, you know, we, we love funny stories.